We can open our Bibles tonight to two places this evening. First Kings chapter 11. So if you'd find First Kings 11, and then also find your place in Second Chronicles 9. So First Kings 11 and Second Chronicles 9. We'll read a few verses here. Uh, we'll begin reading in verse uh, 41 of 1 Kings, and we'll turn over to verse 29 of chapter 9. If you didn't get all that, I will walk us through it as we get there. But right now, I want you in 1 Kings chapter 11. All right, notice, uh, let's stand. Why don't we stand together uh, and uh, as we read the Word of God. And uh, follow along as I read. 1 Kings eleven forty one 41, And the rest of the acts of Solomon and all that he did and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead. Let's turn over to 2 Chronicles 9, the parallel account of this event found in verse 29, 2 Chronicles 9 and verse 29. The Bible says, now the rest of the acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet and in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite? And in the visions of Edo, the seer against Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers, and he was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. Now we'll go back to 1 Kings uh, 11 and primarily go there, but keep a, a marker there in 2 Chronicles. I'll refer to that on f several occasions as well. All right, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this evening. It's yes. been a joy to be in your house tonight. Thank you for just a great service this morning, the folks yes. that were here, you, and then also for the things we've experienced already this evening, just the singing of the great hymns of the faith, uh, just the uh, challenge that we heard about what you did uh, in us and through us last year, and then the special we heard as well. And fathers, we've come to this portion of the service, of the preaching of your word. I pray you'd bless it. I pray you'd fill me afresh and anew yes, with thy spirit. Uh, lead and direct my thoughts and words this evening. And uh, may your word tonight have free course. Open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts yes, this evening we that we might be receptive to your word. Thank you for loving us. Work in our hearts, yes, we pray you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Tonight we're looking at the conclusion of the inspired record of the life of King Solomon. Now, as you know, I've been preaching on his life uh, for many weeks now. I forget the number here. But here we, we, we find the conclusion of the inspired record of his life. In other words, the last scriptural commentary on Solomon's life. This is it. This is the end. Now, Solomon's name is going to be mentioned again in God's Word. This isn't the last time that we see. As a matter of fact, if you kind of do a word search of his name, you'll find that his name appears actually in 50 more verses in the Bible. We find him mentioned in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, Psalms, and obviously Song of Solomon, Jeremiah, Matthew, Luke, John, and Acts, all of them, aside from 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, all of those books make mention of his name. Now the very last passage that mentions Solomon's name was actually found in Acts chapter 7. If you remember, the, that's the place where Stephen was preaching his sermon to the Sanhedrin, and he's kind of going through the history of Israel there and what, what God's dealings with them. And he says this in Acts 7, 46, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him in house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in the temples, uh, in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. So that's the very last time that we find his name mentioned in 
the Bible. But here in these few verses in both 1 Kings 11, 41 through 43 and 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 29, 31, the, the verses I just read, uh, he, in these few verses we, we find what some commentators have deemed as Solomon's obituary. That's interesting, isn't it? They say this is, these verses here, uh, those three I read uh, there in 1 Kings and, and the, the, the three I read in 2 Chronicles are his obituary. Now, very recently here at our church uh, and outside of our church, we have, uh, there's been four funerals of people associated with the church, some very closely associated to our church and others through relatives. Of course, Brother John Moseman went home to be with the Lord and Brother, uh, Brother Bill Shirey went home to be with the Lord. And of course, uh, we had the funeral uh, uh, of Patricia, uh, Jessica's grandma, just a, a few days ago or a little bit back. And then before that was, uh, I think it was Laquisha Gwynn, right? We had, that was the mother of a bus rider, uh, at that funeral as well. And so we've been through this uh, kind of process of a funeral, if you don't mind me saying it that way. And uh, one of the difficult tasks that the family is asked to do is to write up an obituary, an obituary about their loved one. Now, that's not easy. The thing about trying to kind of sum up their lives in just a page or in a few words, but an obituary is an important thing. It really is because it serves as, first of all, as notice to others that someone has deceased. There's some people that may be not connected but knew the person uh, uh, somewhere along the lines and they haven't con kept uh, in contact with them. And it's nice for them to know that uh, the Lord took them home or whatever the case may be. So an obituary does serve as that notice to others, but it also does something else. It also gives a brief account or a kind of bio, biographical sketch of the life and character of the deceased. That's what it is. It's a summary of who they are and what they did with their life. Now, one well-known author said this about obituaries. He said, obituaries should be life-affirming rather than gloomy, but they should also be opinionated, leaving the reader with a strong sense of whether the subject live a good or bad life, whether they were right or wrong in the handling of their public affairs. That's what he says, take or to leave it, whatever, but I'm just saying what he says. Now, now again, obituaries are, are are most often written by the person closest to that person. It could be written by a spouse, often it is, or it's written by the children if there's no spouse involved, or maybe the closest living relative to the deceased, they write up the obituary. But uh, think about this for a moment. As we're reading Solomon's obituary, this one was written by God himself. Amen. God wrote this obituary. God gave us this account, the last words account of Solomon's life. And so here what we're looking at, think of it for a moment, are the final words that God tells us about King Solomon. So that means something. It means that we know that what we find here written about Solomon is accurate. Amen. It's exact. Uh, there's no embellishing, there's no exaggerating, there's no smoothing over things. Uh, what is written is exactly what God himself wants to tell us as he sums up the, the life of King Solomon. And God's word is truth. Jesus said that in John 17, 17. So what God is saying here is true. Amen. So what is he saying about this man? Well, tonight I won't preach on that. I want to preach on this subject that I've entitled, The Departing of a King. The Departing of a King. Well, here it is. I mean, it's been a journey. We've been weeks and weeks in the life of King Solomon, and now we find that Solomon's life has come to an end. It's over. His earthly days are over. His earthly journey is finished. By the way, one day, so will yours, Amen. and so will mine. It'll be over. It'll be finished. All of us die. Right. You say, why is that? Because of sin. I'll get to the rapture in a moment. Don't worry, I know what you're thinking. 
Romans 5, 12, wherefore as one by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all has sinned. Uh, Joshua 23, 14. Listen to what Joshua says. He says, and behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. Amen. We come in this world one by one and we drop out of this world one by one. Right. Some people that are here today will not be here tomorrow. I'm not saying necessarily in this auditorium though. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe me, I don't know. But the point is, one day it's going to be over. Now, while I do believe, I really do believe we are, we are in what I would call the rapture generation. That's just my conviction. I don't know. I don't. No, no, the Lord only knows. But unless the rapture takes place, we're all going to face death. It's going to be over. And it may be sooner than we think. I think it's always sooner than we think, isn't it? We always say, well, I wish I had more time. I wish I could do more. But uh, it comes quick. That's why we read in Proverbs 27.1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, Amen. for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. James 4.14, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then poof! That's my part. God didn't write poof. It vanisheth away. God doesn't write poof. I do. That. <laughs> That's why tonight you need to make sure you're saved. Amen. Don't play around with this thing. Hey, young person, don't think I have all this time in the world. You may not. Amen. You may not. Make sure you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you are saved, be a good idea if you're living for him. Amen. Now, we don't get to heaven because we're living for him, but I think it's a good idea we do live for him. Why? Amen. So we're not ashamed when we meet him face Amen. to face. So again, here in our text, we see that Solomon dies and God gives us uh, his obituary. Did you notice something interesting? It's pretty short. Right. I mean, for all the years he lived and all that he did, it's really just a short summary of his life. You know, the New York Times publishes an average of 1,000 obituaries per year. Uh, each obituary typically averages somewhere between 200 and 300 words. But some are much longer. Some of the longest obituaries that they have ever published were these. Listen to this. President Gerald Ford in the New York Times had an obituary that was 7,674 words. That's long. President Ronald Reagan in New York Times, 11,411 words. President Richard Nixon, 13,155 words. He had a lot of explaining to do, amen? <laughs> and then the longest ever published by the New York Times, John, Pope John Paul II, 13,870 words. That's a long obituary published in the New York Times. I wonder if anybody read the whole thing. Anyway, I'm doing, I'm doing, maybe they did. But notice Solomon's here. That's short. Matter of fact, 1 Kings 11 that I just read, 66 words. 2 Chronicles 9, 79 words. Now, it may be short, but it is unmistakably correct Amen. and accurate because God gave it. And so tonight, I want to just focus on what God has said in these last words about King Solomon. Some of the final things that God wants to highlight or tell us about this man's life. What does God say? Well, let's look at them. Let's notice, number one, I believe we see Solomon's record. We see his record. Notice again, hold your hand in both of these places. We're going to go back and forth to 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. But notice in verse 41, And the rest of the acts of Solomon and all that he did and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon? Then notice 2 Chronicles 9, 29. We'll flip over there. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet and in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite and in the visions of Edo the seer against Jeroboam the son of Nebat? So God, we see Solomon's record here, but I want you to consider and notice two things about his record. Number one is this. Notice the things God recorded in his word. Think about the things God recorded in the Bible. 
Because in First and Kings and Second Chronicles, we read the phrase, and the rest of the acts of Solomon. We read that in First Kings and also in Second Chronicles. So God is telling us something here. Let me get to my point. That there are many things that Solomon did that were not recorded in Scripture. And that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, the Bible didn't record every single thing that Solomon did. The Bible didn't record every single thing the Lord Jesus Christ did. Matter of fact, John went on to tell us all the books in the world couldn't contain it if it did. Uh, but uh, so God is saying here that there are many things that Solomon did that were not a part of the Bible. And he goes on to mention some of the places where man recorded the acts of Solomon. He mentions the book of the acts of Solomon in verse 41 of 1 Kings chapter 11. Then he, in 2 Chronicles 9, he mentions the book of Nathan the prophet and the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite and the visions of Edo the seer. So he's mentioning four different records, four different books, if you will. Now, don't fall into the trap of thinking, oh, no, I guess we're missing part of our Bible. No, we're not. These are not missing books of the Bible. Right. Not at all. Uh, or books that, well, I guess they should have been included. We must have made a mistake. No, no, no. God preserved his words. We have everything we need right here in our King James Bible for English-speaking people. No, no, no. It's not extra stuff uh, that are supposed to be Scripture. We have God's entire revelation in the 66 books of the Bible. It is complete and it is perfect. Uh, by the way, God said this, in case you're trying to go down that route, uh, in Revelation 22, 18, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So don't look at those uh, books and say, oh, I guess they're part of Scripture. No, God says don't add to it. Don't take away from it. We have everything we need. Amen. So what were these books? These books were, or records, were simply secular records written by men. We have them today. Men write history books all the time. And it's interesting because they, these books are named and the authors of these book and books, in three out of the four, are named as well. Now, the first one in 1 Kings, the Acts of Solomon, we don't know who wrote that. But uh, again, they're, they're written in, at the end of verse 41. Are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? Author unnamed. Go over to 2 Chronicles 9. We see the book uh, in verse 29, the book of Nathan the prophet. Who was that? That was that prophet that lived during the days of David. The one that said to David with his sin with Bathsheba, remember, confronted him and said, Thou art the man. He evidently wrote a historical record of David and Solomon as well. And then we read in uh, verse 29 of 2 Chronicles 9, another book that's mentioned, and that is the prophecy of Ahijah. Ahijah was that prophet that, if you remember, I read it last week, that he informed uh, 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 Jeroboam that he would succeed uh, Solomon as king over the ten tribes. Remember, the prophet came to him and he rent the clothes in the twelve pieces and just nod. It was say, right? You remember that? Like, just nod anyway. Help me out here, right? And the ten tribes were represented by those ten pieces of clothing and, and so forth. Evidently, he wrote something as well. And then the visions of Edo, the seer. Hey, there's a name for you, young mothers, or uh, having a mom. Edo or Ido, whatever. Edo, I don't know. Go ahead. Sounds Italian. Hey, Edo. Anyway. Uh, anyway, he was another prophet in the days of Solomon. Again, these were all men that wrote secular historical records in Israel. And these books, think about it. I'm going somewhere here now. These books all contain things that Solomon did. Things that were important to those men that wrote them. But God didn't record the same things. He only recorded certain things and left other things out. Why is that? Here's my point. Because there are certain things in our lives that are of greater importance to God than others. Amen. Did you know that? 
There are. Well, everything's important to God. I, listen, there are certain things that are of greater importance to God in our lives than others. Uh, now, I say this quite often. I say it on purpose quite often. We have to remember that the Bible is not everything that God knows, but it's everything that God wants us to know. It wasn't everything God knew about Solomon. He knew everything about Solomon. But it's everything God wanted us to know about Solomon. So what God recorded for us about Solomon are the things that God wanted us to know about, to learn from, that God wanted to highlight to his people. Can I put it this way? God put down in his word the things that were important to him. Amen. He did. Here's the application. We have to remember something. There are things that are important to God, more important than others. And the things that should be important in life to us should be the things that are important to God. Doesn't that make sense? If they're important to him, then they should be important to us, to us. And the things that are important to God are spiritual things, are eternal things, are things that we do that make a difference for eternity's Amen. sake. Good. And those are the things that God wants us to be concerned about. Amen. Oh, we get so caught up in the things of this world that in things that really don't matter. Colossians 3, 1, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. God is telling us, look, there are things that are important to me, and those are the things that are above, things that are eternal, things that are heavenly, if you will. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, you know the passage, take, uh, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things to the Gentiles seek. Get the picture there? He said, they seek that. That's not important to me. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Amen. and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Again, my point is this. God is not impressed by the things that man is impressed by. Right. Amen. He's not. He's not impressed by your title at work. He's not impressed by your rank in the military. He's not impressed by the amount of money that you make. He's not impressed by how, how large your retirement account is. He's not impressed how attractive you are. I know what you're saying. You're not. I know. I know. I know what he's saying. He's not impressed by how intelligent you are. He's not impressed by how talented you are. He's not impressed by how big your house is, by what kind of car you drive, how nice it is, or whether you, or not you have the latest iPhone. He doesn't care. Amen. He doesn't. He's not impressed by those, those things. By the way, teenager, let's bring it down to you for a moment here. Keep your attention here. God's not impressed by how fast you can text. I got the two thumbs going, amen. I've seen some young people attack. I don't know how they do it so fast. I mean, wow, I can type, but those buttons, they're just too small for me. I mean, they're just too tiny. I can't get my finger. But he's not impressed by how fast you text. He's not impressed by how many friends you have on Facebook. He's not impressed by how many YouTube subscribers you have if you're trying to put some sort of channel together or have, or how many people have watched your YouTube video. He's not impressed by how many likes you have. He's not impressed by how many followers you have on Instagram or what level you've achieved on some video game. Those things mean nothing to God. Amen. They really don't. You see, what's important to God is what you're doing for Him. See, God, God only showed us certain things in Solomon's life. Not all of it, just the things that were important to him. And so we see Solomon's record. We see the things recorded in God's word. But then I think of this. There's also the things God records in heaven. Amen. 
So God has his record in the Bible of what he wants us to know. But did you know that uh, while those men who are writing all those things about Solomon, Edo, and Ahijah, all of those, about his works and his words and his wisdom, that's kind of what the outline were given there in 1 Kings. Again, they did not literally record every single thing. Now, I would imagine, just speculation, they probably had more than God gave us in his word, but they didn't record everything. But there's someone who has everything recorded in heaven. And that's God. You ever think about that? Every single thing. God has a book in heaven that records every single thing that you and I have done. That makes me sh shake in my boots. Right. It really does. I'm, I'm talking about everything we do or we've done, everything we've said, even everything we think. Amen. He knows your actions. He knows my actions. He knows our attitudes. He knows our thoughts. He knows our motives. It's all written in a book. Amen. Now, if you're lost here tonight, you don't have to face every one of those. Revelation 20 and verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Notice, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is a book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So there's no doubt there's more than one book that God has. And there's some speculation as to what they are. But I'm of the belief that God has, of course, the Lamb's book of life, which shows everybody that's saved. Then he has a book of our life of everything we've done. Now, for the lost person, and of course, the Bible is another book that he has. And he's going to look at that lost person's life. He's going to look at the Bible and say, you really think you can get to heaven? Right. I don't think so. Amen. Because you sinned against God. But understand, our omniscient God knows every single thing that we do. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said this in Matthew 12, 36. He said, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Amen. Not just every word, every idle word. Amen. Those words, oh, I didn't mean that, but you said it. You said it. Psalmist also speaks of God knowing all when he says in Psalm 139 about God, thou knowest mine down sitting and mine uprising. God knows what time he got up this morning. He doesn't know what time he went to bed last night. Right. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. I don't know about you, when I read that, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that I know the Lord is my Savior. Amen. I'm thankful that, uh, I thank God that through Jesus Christ, we sung about him tonight, that through faith in Jesus Christ, uh, uh, salvation, all of our sins, if you're saved here tonight, have been washed away. Imagine all the things we've done wrong have been washed away, forgotten. Amen. They're said to be in the depths of the sea as far as the east is from the west. Uh, gone, gone, gone. All my sins are gone. I'm grateful for that. But there's a but. We're still going to give an account for what we've done with our lives Amen. at the judgment seat of Christ. Right. Not for sin, but for rewards. We'll either get rewards or we'll lose rewards. And when we leave this world, I want you to think about this. Our record follows us. Right. It follows us. Revelation 14, 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. My point is this. When we think about Solomon's record, uh, my point is this. Are we making important what God is making important? What God makes important? What he thinks is important. You say, what's that? The souls of men, service Amen. to him, living for him, all of those things. Amen. Solomon's record. Let me see number two, going back to 1 Kings. Uh, uh, we'll look at him again. Look at verse 42, back in 1 Kings chapter 11. We not only see Solomon's record, we see Solomon's reign. 
After he tells us, uh, and the rest of the Acts of Solomon and all that he did, verse 41, and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? There's his record. Notice his reign. And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. Pretty much says the same thing in 2 Chronicles 9.30. And Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over uh, all Israel 40 years. Now, now Solomon... Solomon, evidently, if you do the math and kind of put it together, was in his early 20s or possibly even in his late teens when he became king. Now think about that. So when he died, when he leaves this earth here, he was likely in his early 60s or younger. But his reign, his throne, his kingdom, if you will, his reign was for 40 years. Now, Solomon was the third king in a row that reigned for 40 years. Saul, we know, reigned for 40 years. David, we know, reigned for 40 years. But unlike the other two, Solomon's entire reign was different in that it was from the city of Jerusalem. Saul reigned from his hometown in Gibeah. It wasn't until David became king. Of course, David reigned seven years in Hebron over just Judah, and then 33 years over all Israel. That's when he moved the capital and the throne to Jerusalem. But Solomon, uh, he reigned over all Israel the entire time. Uh, Saul, if you remember, he had a large group, uh, had kind of a people following David, those the 600 men during his reign, uh, and David only reigned over Judah for a bit there. But again, Solomon really reigned over a truly united kingdom, and, and his reign, was, his 40-year reign was during a period of peace. I mean, that's what the Bible tells us until kind of the end when things started to fall apart and God removed his hand of protection from Solomon and he raised up those adversaries. But my point is this, this 40-year this reign of Solomon that God is speaking of was this. It was his opportunity to do something for God. Now, that's what life is. Amen. That's what it is as a Christian. It is our limited earthly opportunity to do something for God. Amen. That's what our life is. Now, again, this time, the, this, frame, this time frame, if you will, this window of opportunity has a beginning. Guess when it begins? It begins when you get saved. Amen. It was, I was serving God before I was saved. No, you weren't. Uh, the, 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 the plowing of the wicked is sin. Amen. There's none righteous, no, not one. So again, that beginning time of service for me and you is when we got saved. And by the way, it has an end as well when we leave this earth. And so everything in between the time we get saved and the time we leave this earth is our reign, is our opportunity, our God-given opportunity to serve God. There it is. Amen. That's it. Now my counsel to all of us is this. And myself as well. Do what you can for God while you can. Amen. Do what you can for God while you can because Amen. you won't be able to do it forever. Right. You know Proverbs 29 verse 18 says this. Where there is no vision the people perish. Let me ask you something. Do you have a vision of your life what you want to do for God? This opportunity that, first of all, make important to you what's important to God, and then see this life, this reign, this span of time as this opportunity, and, and get in your heart, find out, what does God want me to do with my life? What is the Lord leading me to do? What is His will for my life? Because every one of us will go to our graves with some missed opportunities with unfulfilled, if you don't mind me putting it this way, dreams. I'm talking about spiritual dreams. Things that we wished we did for God. Things that we uh, wish we had attempted for God. Things that we wished, I wish I stepped out in faith uh, uh, for, to do uh, for God. Now understand, from this point forward in your life, we cannot change the past. I can't do it. What happened yesterday happened yesterday. It's gone. I can't change it. But I'll tell you what I can do. I can change the now. Amen. And I can change my plan Praise for the Lord. future. And let me say this. Don't wait any longer. Amen. Do what you can now for God while you're still here. You know, some of us, we put ourselves in the grave way before we should. 
We really do. Well, I, 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 I'm 50 years old, so I, I, you know, you know, I, I'm going to let somebody else do that. Stop already. Listen, everybody has pains. Everybody has aches. You know, you're not until, you know, when you hit 40, then your body starts talking to you. It tells you what it wants to do instead of you telling it what to do. That's just kind of the way it goes. But, but, but understand, you still have life in you. Amen. You know, Caleb was 85 years old. He still had a vision. When speaking to Joshua, do you remember what he said? At the 85 years old, he said, And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these 40 and 5 years, past the 40 years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now I am this day four score and five years old, as yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, uh, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now, therefore, he says, give me this mountain. Amen. Man, I want that spirit. Praise the Lord. 85 years old, and he wasn't putting himself in the grave. He wasn't done for God. You know, he could have said, yeah, yeah, I remember the days when we went into the land. And, and boy, those 10 spies, they said bad things. And we, me and Joshua, we were the men of faith. And yeah, 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 what a day that was. He could have reveled in that moment the rest of his life and forgetting about, about the future, thinking that was his highlight. But he didn't. Amen. He wanted more. He wanted to do more for God. He wasn't dead yet. He wasn't done yet. He's going on and on. And he says, yeah, here we are. And I want that mountain. I want to do something uh, for God. That's the way all of us should be. Amen. You know, Daniel Marshall, he labored with Shubal Stern. You ought to read about his life. His son was Abraham Marshall. He's a great Baptist preacher. He planted the first Baptist church in Georgia, in Keoki, in 1772, he was 65 years old when he planted that church. Amen. 65. Amen. I think I've told you this story. When Pastor Bird was here on earth, uh, he, was, uh, he was at Mainland Baptist Church when he led us to the Lord. Uh, then he went up to uh, the Daleville area where Mr. Horn was from up there. And he pastored a church up there uh, for I think it was 8 to 10 years or so. But anyway, he felt he was in his early 50s and he felt led of God to plant a church. And he wanted to plant the church in Vineland. And so he felt led of the Lord. And so he kind of told everybody, you know, that's what I feel the Lord's going to do. His wife was on board and they were going to do that. Do you know how much grief he got from people that said things like this? You're too old to do that. That's what they said. You're too old. Let the, you know, the young guys, these guys coming out of college, they're the church planners. I don't think so. And I don't want that spirit of you're too old to do that. I want, I want to go forward till I can't go forward anymore. I want to fight until I can't fight anymore. And I know you do too. And that's the way it's supposed to be. You see, our reign, our, our time on this earth is limited. Let's make the most of it from the beginning all the way till the end. Let's not retire on God. Amen. Keep going for him. Psalm 90 and verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. At, at the end of my life, uh, I, I, I know and, and at the end of your life, we're not going to regret those God-given goals and dreams that we Amen. pursued. We're going to regret the ones we didn't. We're going to look back and say, I should have. I wish I did. Listen, get your vision from God. Get to know what God wants you to do and do it while you, you can because your reign will only last so long. Amen. So number one, we see Solomon's record. Number two, Solomon's reign. And then number three, and we're done, Solomon's replacement. So it's interesting in verse 43, just three verses, three points, there they are. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. So we read Solomon slept with his fathers. I think that had the idea of going on to glory. I do. I think that's the spiritual sleep in the Lord. And notice it's interesting. They did bury him in the city of David. Uh, by the way, it was an honor to be buried in the city of David as a king, uh, some of them that did not do right, they would not bury them in the city of David. Uh, but in, think about this. In spite of his apostasy, remember at the end what he was doing? He was building all those houses uh, uh, to, to heathen gods and all of that. And they still buried him in Jerusalem. They still gave him an honorable funeral. I'd imagine just knowing Solomon and the grandeur of everything he did, it must have been quite a funeral. 
I mean, it must have been quite a procession. But understand, when it's all said and done, and the service or whatever happened is over, the burial takes place, and the, the crowd begins to dissipate and go, uh, go home. Here, standing there in the middle of it all, is this young man, the next king, his son, Rehoboam. Rehoboam. Do you know, according to Bible scholars, and I, that's all I've come up with as well. I'm not saying I'm a scholar. I'm just saying I read things. Uh, Rehoboam was Solomon's only son. Stop and think about that for a moment. Think of all the wives and all the concubines and everything. I don't know. Maybe he had some kind of medical problem. I don't know. But anyway, he only had one son. But it's interesting. When we read about the life of Rehoboam, it's a life of great disappointment. Right. Because Rehoboam was not ready for the throne. Right. Rehoboam did not have the wisdom that Solomon had. Okay, I get the argument. Well, God gave that to him. I understand that. But he didn't have the skills that Solomon had. He didn't have the organizational skills. He did not have the people skills that Solomon had. He, Rehoboam was not a man of character. I mean, Rehoboam was not a man of ability. In fact, uh, if you read 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 14, the way he acted, it sounds like he was a selfish and cruel young man. Right. Look at verse 14. And he spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. That was the next king. But you know what? That's all they had. That was it. It seems to me that Solomon's final failure was that he never prepared a successor for the throne. Maybe he was too busy with women. Maybe he was too busy building stuff for his concubines. Whatever the case may be, it seems to me that he never trained his son. He didn't plan for the future. He didn't think of what he was leaving behind. And may I say this uh, without sounding too harsh, that's a selfish act. Amen. If all I care about is my life and not what happens to my children and grandchildren and what I leave behind me, if I don't care about that, that's very selfish. Right. We should care about it. You see, as God gives this obituary, uh, again, uh, he, he talks about uh, Solomon's uh, record. He talks about Solomon's reign, and, and now he's talking about his replacement uh, that wasn't a good one. Right. Do you know that God's way has always been, stay with me here, I'm almost done, to prepare the next generation to serve God. That is part of what we are to do here in whatever role that we have. 2 Timothy 2, 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Christ taught Paul. Paul told, taught Timothy. Timothy is being told by Paul, what I taught you, commit to faithful men so they can commit it to other faithful men also. In other words, you need to train the next generation generation so when you leave they can pick up where you left off Amen. that's part of what we're supposed to do you know that's one of the reasons why I do the watch night service it's not for a show it's not for a preaching competition it's not for fun although it is fun I enjoy it I really Amen. do but you know what I'm trying to do I'm trying to get whoever it is that feels possibly called to preach up here so they can see has God called me to preach or not? and they can get some training uh, we could talk about preaching to people but I'll tell you what you get behind this pulpit and the whole thing changes you know you got to experience that so understand if you're a preacher of God's Word when you leave this earth you ought to leave preachers trained behind you if you are a teacher of God's Word, maybe Sunday school or instant, whatever it may be, uh, you ought to train others to teach what you taught. That's why in my classes I always say, I want you to have a notebook. And here's why. I said, because what I'm teaching you is simply things that people gave to me. I want you to have a notebook so that you can take this and open it up and teach others also. 
So it keeps going. It keeps going. If you play an instrument for God, you should be training others to do the same. If you sing for God, you should be training others to do the same. You name it. If you're a soul winner, if you work the sound, if you're an usher, if you're a bus worker, you should be training others uh, uh, to come up after you because one day you're going to be gone. If you have to be out one day for whatever reason, sickness or vacation or whatever, and there is not somebody trained that can easily take your spot, you haven't done your job. Amen. You haven't done your job. And by the way, that training begins in our homes. Amen. In our homes. 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. And we do that, why? Because when we depart from this world, we want God's work to carry on Amen. strong. The departing of a king, Solomon's obituary. One day, you and I are out of here. It is what it is. I hope it's the rapture. Right? The hole in the sky instead of the hole in the ground. That's what I'm looking for. Amen. But if God wrote your obituary, what would it read? What would your record look like? The things that are important to him. What would your reign look like? That opportunity that he gave you to serve him. What did you do with that? And then are you training a replacement for you and a successor so that when you do leave this world, that there'll be someone right on your heels, ready to either hit where you are or go somewhere else and, and, and keep going for God. Amen. It ought to be a good obituary, amen. amen. And I hope it will be. Let's pray.